Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Resilient Advisor Show. My name is Jay Coulter, and today we're talking about one of my favorite topics, the problem with CPI in financial plans. Joining me today is Ed Butowski of Chapwood Investments to talk about his index that tries to solve that problem. About two months ago, I was brainstorming ways to add value to the Resilient Advisor Network and my clients who are financial advisors. And one of the ideas that I brainstormed was to come up with a different way to measure inflation so that they could better protect their clients while building out financial plans. Started doing some research, and it turns out that Ed and his team have already done all the work. I cold called Ed, asked him about his index. He was very generous with his time, and he agreed to come on the show and tell his story about the path that he went on with this index and how he uses it with his clients in his advisory business. Ed, thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Jay. All right. Let's set some context. Would you mind telling viewers and listeners a little bit about your background prior to creating this index? Sure. I grew up at Morgan Stanley. Um, I actually ran the high net worth group at Morgan Stanley in the Southwest. And when I went off on my own, uh, formed Chapwood Investments, uh, one of the things that I always wanted to do was honor my mother, which sounds kind of of weird, but my mother, when she was uh, very sick and she eventually passed away, she, she said to me something about my father not adjusting her alimony for cola. And I was embarrassed. I, I thought, my goodness, you drink tab. What do you mean cola? And I had no idea about the cost of living adjustment. And then I started looking into it and found a man named Albert Singlinger who ran a program that gave an alternative to the CPI back in 1983 when the CPI was changed and how they changed the way they calculated inflation. It went from 13% down to 3% in one year. Like which, magic. Which, which just sounded ridiculous to me. And as I looked at it, I, I realized that the COLA, the cost of living adjustment, was all messed up. And it wasn't factually true. It didn't justify or support real life experiences. So then I eventually found a man uh, who took over for Albert Singlinger's work, a guy named uh, John Williams, who has a, a, a great website called Shadow Stats. And I started following him and researching it. And one day I said to him, why don't you do it city by city? And he said he didn't have time to do that. And I thought, how could I do it city by city? Because every city has a different cost of living increase. And a lot of it has to do with taxes. And the taxes that are generated in a lot of the blue states make it so the cost of living increase. It's not the cost of living that's the issue. It's the cost of living increase that's the issue. So I set up a program through my Facebook friends where I have 500 items that we look at every six months as to what their percentage increase is um, on those items. And we then weight them according to what percentage of somebody in ordinary Americans uh, income goes to those. Okay, Ed, let, we'll get to that, exactly how you construct the index. But let's start with, let's go back to the actual problem, CPI and the challenges that it presents. So up on the screen here, I'm showing a one-year chart of CPI using my Charts account. When you look at this at 1.27%, again, at the national level, give us your thoughts and why this dovetails into your work. Well, it's complete nonsense. I mean, it's it's, it's, you know, you have to remember that all government officials want that number to be lower. Uh, so they pay out less money in government entitlement programs. So they've manipulated that number going back to 1983. There were 1,700 items that they would monitor every single month. And they never changed that basket uh, or rarely changed that basket. And then in 1983, under the Boskin Commission, they um, actually, it was under uh, Gingrich, they changed the way they calculated the CPI. So today, when you look at that number saying that your cost of living increase has gone up, you know, 1.27%, I mean, who believes that? 
I mean, just look at your taxes, look at your water bills, look at, you know, electricity, look at, you know, gas prices have come down, but look at the taxes on, on gas and, you know, look at everything that you buy. I mean, I, I did something, Jay, one day where um, I just did a bagel. And if a bagel, a bagel goes up about 15 cents a year. If you ate a bagel every single morning, um, you would, it, just that alone would increase your cost $53 a year. Wow. Yeah. And speaking of food, that's where I've seen the highest amount of inflation in my little bubble in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. Our food costs have gone through the roof. Yep. And I've always, and I wish I could remember where I heard this first, but they made a comment that things that require debt seem to go up a lot more than things that don't, specifically college education, housing. Those prices are, are they're through the roof, at least in the southeastern part of the United States. Yeah. And in college was one of the first things that I saw was that there was a cost of living increase, but then the college was 8% compared to, you know, two or 3%. And that was just a general, you know, you know, number that somebody had thrown out, but you got to look at a college as a mini USA, uh, cause you have food, you have lodging, you have, you know, everything that goes into your day-to-day -day living, you can find in a college and the college do, do not manipulate that number at all. Mm -hmm. what, so why do you think we see presumably smart people in the financial media arguing that there is no inflation or inflation is low? Because they don't take the time to really dive into what the problem is. And, and as financial advisors, we have a responsibility to build portfolios for people who are going to be able to maintain that you know, lifestyle for the rest of their lives. And if we talk to them about what the real cost of living increase is, we would, you know, really scare the bejeebers out of them. I can't believe I said bejeebers. I think that's a real word. I like um, it. I'm going to cut that out in a clip and I'm going to see if I can work it in at another part of the show. <laughs> but 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 we would we would scare them to death. But this is where I, I have a problem with financial advisors. We all know that the CPI is not accurate but we don't have the guts to bring it up. And that's one of the reasons that I did this index as well is to highlight that after somebody has, you know, a 10% a, a rate of return, what is their real return after taxes, after expenses, and after their cost of living increase? That's what we have to be talking to our clients about. And most people don't do that. And I really wish that we would. So, I mean, this is a little off our talking points for this show, but I've got a theory on that because most financial plans would fail if you're putting in the rates that I'm about to show viewers that you are calculating the cost of living increases are in each city. What are your thoughts? That, but that's exactly correct. In fact, most people after, you know, when they talk about retiring, you ever notice that when someone's retired on a fixed income, their, their, their presence at Christmas time get worse. Um, and it's, it's remarkable because, you know, I have a, 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 my kids have a grandmother and she used to send a hundred dollars, then it was fifty dollars, then it was twenty-five dollars. Now it's just a card. Because because every single year her standard of living or her, you know, her cost of living has gone up so much that if she was living off of a five percent increase and her cost of living was going up seven percent, she was losing purchasing power. So it only took 10 years of her to lose 20% purchasing power on, on a scenario like that. Yeah. Yep. And it creates this quagmire for people building portfolios for retirees today that is almost insurmountable. So having the difficult inflation conversation can be hard to do. Yeah. And it's easy for advisors to fall back on the CPI because if they have a portfolio that returned 4% and they say, well, your cost of living increased, your CPI was only 1.2, so you made 3%. They're really lying to these people if they understand exactly what the cost of living increase really is in their city. That's right. Great segue. Let's talk about how you compute the Chapwood Index. I'm going to throw up the numbers for the 50 major cities. Walk us through the process, Ed. Sure. Well, what, what we do is we, we went and found the 500 items that people spend most of their money on. And I did this through a survey. We started off with 4,000 different items and I sent it out to all my Facebook friends and I got these back. And then we narrowed it down to the 500 items that people spend the majority of their money on. And then we just went just like the old CPI would do without manipulation and went and looked at every single item 
And, you know, there's there's differences that people will have with it. People have asked me for some time to go into specific details about every weighting. And I don't do that because, you know, the, the thought is that, you know, you have to buy off on the idea that things are much more expensive than than what the government puts out. And what I don't do is go into the weightings on everything because somebody, you know, somebody much smarter than me will come along and and pinpoint what's wrong with it. And and I don't want that. I, I want there to be more of a message that the government index is not an accurate measure of your cost of living increase. Yeah, it seems to me a good way to overcome that is just to weight all the cities and average them and then apply it. Or t- or you, you're suggesting take it down to the actual city level in application for clients. But when thinking about it conceptually, it doesn't even really matter. You're looking at, what, what are we looking at here? Double digit inflation the last five years on yep. average across the 50 major cities? Without question. Yeah. And, and you can see that, you know, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, you know, Houston, they're all very, very high numbers. So if you're not making that much more in terms of your income, you're losing purchasing power, let alone if you're building a portfolio that doesn't get them that. And most portfolios aren't going to get them this. And that's why some people have to question how many people's clients' lives are better because of the relationship they had or have with their financial advisor. You know, how many people's lives are really that much better And our first job is to preserve purchasing power. Well, in order to do that, we have to shoot straight with our clients and tell them what their cost of living increase is so they know what they have to make for their purchasing power. So for podcast listeners, I'm going to read a couple of these numbers out so you can really grasp the magnitude of the impact of this inflation calculation. Number one, if you look at Oakland, which has the highest five-year average inflation rate of 13.2%. San Jose, 12.9. San Francisco, 12.8. Sacramento, 12.6. Long Beach, 12.5. There's a theme here. The top five are all in the state of California, where if you're planning for clients in the state of California, you're dealing with high state taxes plus this inflation. Ed, how does the advisor present this paradigm to their clients? Well, let me tell you, most people, when you present it, they think there's no way in the world that's true. Um, and and so what you have to do is you have to ask them, and this is how I finally first got into doing this, is I listed for people to write down everything they spent their money on for my clients and ask them to monitor every single month what the cost went up. And then a lot of people said they wouldn't do that. But I eventually got to the point where I said, fine, I'll do it for you. And that's where the Chapwood Index came from, was me going out and creating this on my own. But the the advisor has a hard time bringing up this subject, but you should ask your client to go back to their bills and look at their food costs, look at their electricity bills. Um, I mean, just an electricity bill going up, you know, just, you know, one penny per megawatt or kilowatt, excuse me. You know, you know, if he goes from 10 to 11, my goodness, if you have the same usage, that's a 10% increase right there. Um, it's, it's frightening. And this is why so many people, when they get older, aren't happy. You, know, you ever meet a really happy older person? Um, you rarely ever do because their costs continue to skyrocket while their money doesn't move with them. And this is something that we need to highlight. And, and what really kills me also are people who are middle income and lower income wage earners that follow the rules all the time, they, you know, they might take a bus to work, um, or they might work, you know, uh, you know, walk to work, and they work at a factory or a plant of some kind, and they get paid based on the uh, salary increase by somebody giving them a thumbs up or a thumbs down, um, but based on the CPI. So somebody who's making fifty thousand dollars a year might get a a three percent increase in what they make. Well. You know, if their cost of living goes up 10%, then they've they've lost 7% purchasing power. So it only takes a little while for them to then look into other ways of making money, sometimes, sadly, illegally. Um, you, you really have a problem with that. So that's why the, 
people who are quote one percenters or financial advisors can dictate how much money they make based on how many clients they have and what they're what they're managing and what they're charging you have the control to make whatever it is that you want to make or that you're able to make but a lot of people who are middle income and lower income their salary increases are based on somebody dictating how much over the cpi or equal to the cpi they're going to make and that's just not good enough so it only takes about five or ten years before they're falling further behind and they can't make ends meet. Yep, excellent, Ex well put. You're articulating what a lot of folks who are dealing with senior clients are, are going through. Anything yeah. else about the Chapwood Index that you think financial advisors should know as it relates to implementing this index in their practice should they want to? Well, I'll tell you right now, most financial advisors won't implement this um, because it's too all, you know, it's all struck, it's, it's too much. Um, but you should look at this and, and bring this up, at least tell people that their cost of living increase is 6% and, and build portfolios that will get them that. And in a fixed income world, you have to look at things like senior rate floating notes and business development companies and preferreds to get people the income that they need to offset their cost of living increase. You have to go a little further out on the risk curve to offset this. Otherwise, you're just building basically, um, you know, a, a, a terrible situation for your client that eventually they're going to end up moving because they're not going to be able to make ends meet. Excellent. For audio listeners, you can learn more about the Chapwood Index, which Ed gives away this work at chapwoodindex.com. That is chapwoodindex.com. So, Ed, you wrote a book called Wealth Mismanagement. Tell listeners a little bit about it. Well, wealth mismanagement, you know, I grew up at Morgan Stanley, as I said, and it took me a little while to get to the point where I realized that I was in an industry that there wasn't a lot of training on how to properly build a portfolio and how to construct a portfolio. We were building portfolios with historical rates of returns of seven and standard deviations of 15. And most people don't know what that means, but, but that's a, a very wide range of his of, of you know potential returns and i i realized that people were taking too much risk for the expected return so i built uh, or i wrote this book um, along with dennis neal uh, and what it does is it lays out exactly how to score a portfolio and i created something called the chip score which stands for the chapwood investment portfolio score and it uses the cost of living increase and it talks about the real rate of return that people get in a portfolio. And if you have a negative real rate of return, then your score is very low. And so this is a book that a lot of financial advisors, again, won't like, but I don't have a problem talking about it, Jay, this and the Chapwood Index, because I think it's important that we take pride in what we do and that we're making people's lives better. And the only way we can do that is to be honest with them about what they should expect from a portfolio. And that's what the chip score does. And that's what wealth mismanagement does is it, it talks about some of the dirty secrets of financial advisors and not in a terribly negative way because I think most financial advisors want to do a good job. I think that most of the training that financial advisors get is terrible. Um, I remember going to uh, FINRA and talking about how they need to have a better way of evaluating portfolios because if they just look at, well, you have 50% fixed income and 50% equities, well, who says that's a good portfolio? And how do you score that? And most of the time, that's not a good portfolio. And you need to have alternatives in a portfolio uh, so you can reduce the volatility in the portfolio. And that's something that we talk about in wealth mismanagement. Excellent. Viewers and listeners, you can pick up a copy of Wealth Mismanagement at Barnes & Noble or Amazon or by visiting wealthmismanagement.com. That is wealthmismanagement.com. Ed, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I know I'm a big fan of your index and will be uh, using it in my conversations with advisors about building out financial plans that can withstand whatever's coming the rest of this decade. Thanks again for coming on, Ed. Great. Thank you very much.